Florida State will upset second-ranked Miami. Final score, 24 to 10, and listen to this crowd. Florida State has upset second-ranked Miami. And the ball game is over. Florida State 24, Florida 17. That's the end of the ball game. He stopped at the 11-yard line, and Florida State has defeated 11th-ranked Auburn 22 to 14. With a record of 10-2, the 1989 Seminoles finished among the nation's top three for a third consecutive season and may have made the strongest case for a college football playoff in years. Almost to a man, Florida State was considered the best team in college football at the end of the season. And it was from an unusual start that the Seminoles laid claim to their third place national ranking. Bobby Bowden, in his 14th year at the Seminole helm, took the Knolls into a season that saw FSU face one of the nation's toughest schedules ever. The Tribe would finish the year having played six of the nation's top ten defenses. They would finish with a ten-game winning streak, the longest in college football. And they would finish with their seventh consecutive bowl victory. Since starting the season with two losses, the 1989 Florida State Seminoles showed true character and determination, along with the will to win. FSU would kick off the 1989 campaign in Jacksonville, Florida, against an inspired Southern Mississippi team. The Seminoles opened the year on national television, a place that would feel at home, as FSU was nationally televised a phenomenal seven times, including a record five appearances on ESPN. The Golden Eagles came into the game with a new offense that kept the Seminole defense guessing all afternoon. A touchdown with less than a minute left would give the Eagles a 30 to 26 upset over the sixth ranked Warriors. On September 9th, the Clemson Tigers invaded Doak Campbell Stadium for the home opener. They came with revenge on their minds to try to erase memories of the infamous Punt Ruski. ESPN's cameras captured the action as Florida State looked for the W. After getting behind early, the Knolls fought back hard. Unfortunately, it was not enough. Well, in the preseason, uh, many of the writers, the scribes, the writers, the media, had picked Florida State pretty high. I think anywhere from maybe three to tenth, and I think maybe a consensus number five or six. Well, I, I knew doggone all well, that was strictly a question mark because I knew we had a very good nucleus returning. We had an unproven quarterback that I felt like could do it and had played some, and then but we had a lot of question marks. Uh, so anyway, the first two games, uh, uh, we just were not good enough to play the way we were playing and win and uh, uh, so we got behind and but we played a lot of young boys during that time and they began to fill their uh, place on our team and our coaching staff began to see who fits here and who does not fit here and this guy fits here and he don't fit there and, and after that with the leadership of our seniors uh, we were, our boys were able to pull it out. While the 0-2 start dropped the Seminoles from the nation's favor temporarily, it provided the backdrop for one of the most stirring charges in the history of college football. Tested would be the characters of coaches and players alike, and Florida State would respond admirably, winning their next 10 games against some of the country's top teams and put in its bid as national champion. Leading the way was a group expected to be among the nation's best, and three others who rose from relative obscurity. Combined with the best senior leadership in Florida State history, the 1989 Seminoles would no longer be denied. 
The Fab Four was considered to be the best group of receivers this side of the NFL, and they set out every Saturday to prove it. Terry Anthony. Ronald Lewis. Lawrence Dossey. And Bruce Lesane humble the nation's proudest defenses and inspired even the most stoic sports fan to marvel. Dexter Carter was the all-purpose man. Shifty, speedy, and dangerous, his superb rushing and receiving abilities made him a lethal weapon in the Seminole arsenal. Odell Hagens was the inspirational leader on the Seminole defense, and he ruled the inside of the line of scrimmage like a man fighting his last fight. He teamed with Eric Hayes to form what would be the most feared defensive front in college football, sacking quarterbacks with a frequency that could only be described as awesome. Kirk Carruthers, one of FSU's rising stars for 1990, led FSU in tackles with 145. And from obscurity came three other leaders. Leroy Butler stepped into the sizable shoes of All-American quarterback Deion Sanders and carried on the tradition, repeating the honor himself. Butler's hard-hitting style and ability to get to the football set opposing quarterbacks to the sideline, shaking their heads. Center Michael Tanks anchored an offensive line that gave the FSU passing attack enough time to break 23 records, including most total offensive yards in a season. But the man who led these Seminoles from an 0-2 start to a number three finish was a fifth-year senior quarterback who had waited patiently for his turn in the sun, then blinded everybody with his ability. Number four, Peter Tom Willis, would break nearly all of FSU's passing records and had, in simple words, the finest season any Seminole quarterback had ever had. Had the wear, Andre Ware with Houston, had he not had such a great year, Peter Tom not only would have been a candidate for the Heisman, but he might have won it because he was the key to our turnaround as if you talk about just one position. Bobby Bowden would acknowledge the senior leadership on this team to be one of the best he's ever had. After a pair of season opening losses, the tribe would never look back. In front of national television cameras for the third consecutive week and with a must-win tag to the game, Florida State headed to Tiger Stadium to take on LSU. Senior quarterback Peter Tom Willis served notice on this cool September night that he would be the man to lead FSU on a string of wins that left all of college football amazed. The Morris, Alabama native would throw for over 300 yards for the first time. Before his final season was over, he would set a school record with seven games of 300 or more yards passing. Terry Anthony burned the Tigers up top, catching seven crisp aerials for 101 yards, and Dexter Carter hammered the LSU defense for 95 rushing yards as the Seminoles amassed 522 yards of total offense. After giving up two field goals, the FSU defense came alive and spent the evening punishing purple and gold ball carriers, setting up opportunities for the dangerous tribe offense. And Hodgson, the little here, it's a picked off by Tony Moss at the 30-yard line. They tried to lay it out over the linebacker, and Tony Moss picks it off. And the Seminoles have it at the LSU 26. In the second quarter, FSU's offense marched 80 yards in 12 plays to take a 7-6 lead. The Seminole offense showed it could handle pressure as Willis hit Lawrence Dossey with a 12-yard pass on fourth and two at the LSU 17. Paul Moore's second carry ended in the end zone to give FSU the lead. Florida State uses a wide open attack to open the second half with Terry Anthony reaching pay dirt on a 32-yard Willis pass to put the tribe up 17 to six. 
it was FSU's 17th unanswered point and stunned the legendary Tiger Stadium crowd. LSU got things going their way as they answered with their finest drive of the night. The Tigers were inspired and scored some more to go ahead 21 to 17 early in the fourth quarter. Facing the possibility of losing a third straight game, the Seminole defense, led with 10 tackles by All-American nose guard Odell Higgins, stiffened to give the offense room to work. It was very aggressive. You know, we changed our game plan defensively wise and we went out and you know, played the way we can play against, you know, a great team. So we went out, our coaches let it loose and our talent beat LSU. PT led the Garnet and Gold on a game winning drive. Willis with his running backs out of the pro set. Bootleg. Runs toward his right. Still running toward his right. He's going to run with the football. He's to the one. Touchdown, Peter Tom Willis. It was capped off by this seven-yard run with 10.55 left in the game, sending the large contingent of Seminole faithful into a frenzy. The 31 to 21 victory gave Bobby Bowden his fifth win and six tries at the Tigers den in Baton Rouge. And once again, the eyes of the nation turned back to Tallahassee. Over 61,000 fans poured into Doak Campbell Stadium for Parents Day and a September 23rd afternoon game with Tulane. The crowd was treated to the Seminoles' finest offensive performance of the year as Peter Tom Willis threw for 324 yards in the first half alone to even the record at 2-2 with a 59-9 route of the Green Wave. The Tribe raced to a 17-0 lead after the first quarter as Richie Andrews got things started for the Red Hot Seminole offense, hitting a 28-yard field goal. Willis who would complete the game hitting 18 of 33 passes, connected with Lawrence Dossey on a 30-yard touchdown strike. Then fellow Fab Four member Terry Anthony on a 12-yard pass to put Tulane away early. Dexter Carter swept one yard around the right side of FSU's powerful line to open the second quarter with another FSU score. And freshman tailback Amp Lee made the most of his first college carry as he raced six yards to pay dirt to provide the 31 to nothing halftime margin. FSU's defense showed the big play capability that would propel the Seminoles throughout the season as All-American quarterback Leroy Butler snared a pair of interceptions and pounced on a fumble. Well, I knew going into the going into the Tulane game that big plays had to be made, things had to be done. You know, we had to hit some sacks if not interceptions, and I think a lot of people did that. But uh, I needed to set the tone in the secondary because people had a lot of questions whether I can play cornerback and whether Earl McCorv and players like that can can we really play together and I think we you know we handled that well but uh, I was excited you know it was just one of those games I felt real good and I felt just like one of big player of mine should set up a touchdown or put my team in a position to win I think I did that. With Willis already on the bench, Casey Weldon came on to throw his first pass of the season. The toss was an easy flip to Amp Lee for his first reception, which the freshman faked and glided to an 88-yard score. One man to beat to the 30-yard line. Amp Lee to the 20. Amp Lee to the 10. Amp Lee will score a touchdown. Oh my. Weldon also hit Lawrence Dossey with a 56-yard touchdown pass. Diving catch. It is caught. And the Seminoles have Lawrence And tight end Dave Roberts with another score to complete a near-perfect day. Weldon had completed three of four passes, all three for touchdowns. FSU rolled to 578 yards of total offense, including 485 yards through the air. But more importantly, the Seminoles had evened their record at 2-2 and positioned themselves for a run at the toughest part of their schedule.
FSU took to the road once again on October 7th, this time to the Carrier Dome, where Don McPherson's Syracuse club was unbeaten over the previous 16 games. The Seminole defensive front made a mockery of a Syracuse offensive line that had been called the best of the nation. Odell Hagens, Eric Hay, Shelton Thompson, and hosts of others combined to sack the Orangemen nine times. Come on, come on, turn around! And FSU's big play offense averaged nearly seven yards per play and stunned the home team, giving Florida State a 41 to 10 win. The Tribe's second score came via the defensive big play when Leroy Butler stepped in front of an Orangeman to pick off one of his seven interceptions on the year and returned at 23 yards to the 32. Dexter Carter trotted in from seven yards out to put the Knolls up 10 to nothing. After a Syracuse field goal, FSU wasted little time in quieting the dome as PT got hot. Before the smoke could settle, Willis was downfield and into the end zone to extend the lead to 17 to three at the half. FSU blew the game wide open with a 17 point third quarter, highlighted by a pair of scores by Seminole defenders. FSU laid claim to the play of the year when freshman punt returner Terrell Buckley camped out under a Syracuse punt and stood motionless as the Orangemen bared down, led up, then could only chase as the crafty rookie raced 69 yards in front of a shocked crowd for a 27 to three lead. All-American Leroy Butler got his second interception of the day, and he got into the scoring act, bolting 87 yards for the touchdown. Amp Lee's fourth quarter scamper capped off the scoring as the mighty Seminoles lay waste to a once proud Syracuse squad by a final margin of 41 to 10. Now, I think that was a game that Florida State showed the nation we were pretty good because Syracuse at that time, Florida, Miami, Syracuse and Florida State were the, were the three winningest teams in that order. Uh, over the last three years or two years and so so and they'd only lost one game and so I think when Florida State goes to New York where so much of the media and the press is uh, and won decisively that then that's when people begin to realize Florida State might be on the way back. Another tough road test was ahead for the Seminoles the next week as FSU took on Virginia Tech's top 10 ranked defense in Blacksburg. And Peter Tom Willis answered with a 338 yard passing day, a mid chance of Willis for Heisman. The Hokies illustrious defense was humbled by Willis who threw for three touchdowns and led the tribe to a 41 to seven win. The Seminoles fourth in a row. After some seminal excitement early in the first quarter, the game looked like it would be a classic defensive struggle. Leroy Butler, for the second week in a row, set up FSU's first score when he intercepted a hokey aerial at the 19 and returned it to the 11. Dexter Carter made quick work of the Butler's setup as he took Willis's pass across from the 14 to give FSU an early 7-0 edge. The second quarter saw FSU take control with 17 points. 
Ampley and Bennett quarterback keeper by Willis. He is close. There's no, it is a touchdown. Florida State punches it in on the quarterback sneak by P.T. Willis from the 25. Third down. Willis looks toward his right. Throws the pass downfield. It is caught by Dossie. Dossie spins to the 50-yard line. Here's Ronnie Lewis wide to the right side. Willis looks toward his right. Alley-oop toward Lewis. He makes the catch. Touchdown. Florida State. What little hope the Hokies had was stifled under the Seminoles' murderous pass rush. Forced to throw to get back in the game, the Seminole front line pinned back their ears and came after Hokie quarterbacks, sacking them nine times on the day. Well, it was important for us to, you know, to keep our caliber of play up. Uh, they had the number three defense in at that time, and we wanted to show them that we had a great defense and we had to play you know, like we had been practicing and not doing everything in practice. You know, you have to do it in practice as well in, in the game. And that was what we were trying to put into perspective. The Tribe took a 24-0 lead at halftime, and Virginia Tech fans could only marvel at the Seminole defense, which allowed just 40 first-half yards. Willis hit freshman star Amp Lee on a 67-yard scoring strike in the third quarter to ice the game. Facing one of the nation's toughest defenses, Florida State had outgained the Hokies 534 yards to 174 and served notice to the college football world that they were back. The Auburn Tigers came to Tallahassee on October 21st, bent on revenge. The Seminoles had beaten the proud War Eagle teams twice over the last two seasons, including last year's thrilling Sugar Bowl. The game would prove to be a near mirror image. To make the game even more dramatic, FSU starting tailback Dexter Carter was nursing an injury, and pure freshman Amp Lee was drawing his first starting assignment. It was obvious from the start that the game would be another classic between these Southern powerhouses and, as both coaches predicted, a defensive battle. The Seminoles' normally unstoppable offensive attack struggled against the Tigers' ferocious defense, but Lee managed to pound out 110 yards on 25 carries to lead the offense. But Auburn had an even tougher time against an FSU defense that was becoming one of the most feared in the land. FSU's linebackers flew at Tiger ball carriers with reckless abandon. Kirk Carruthers registered 10 tackles. And Kelvin Smith, seven, to lead the defense. And when the linebackers weren't punishing Tiger tailbacks, the sack pack was introducing Reggie Slack to the Doak Campbell turf. Senior Eric Hayes appealed to the crowd for its approval after each of his three and a half sacks. FSU would register six sacks on the day. After field goals by both teams late in the first quarter, FSU scored 19 unanswered points. The Tribe's first drive started on their own 37. Willis will drop straight back, a deep drop, looks down, field gets the pass away. He's got Amplia the 40, Lee to the 45, Lee to the 48-yard line. On third down and nine, Willis throws the ball, airs it out, far side, catch made, first down achieved at the 40-yard line. Play fake Willis under pressure, gets the pass away. He's got a receiver, Dossie, inside the 25 to the 20. Handoff to Bennett, off left guard, touchdown, Florida State. Bennett knocked it in with just over 11 minutes to go in the half to give FSU a lead they would never relinquish. After a poor punt set FSU up at the Auburn 40, the Tribe needed just four plays before fullback Bennett lumbered in from the seven to give FSU an apparently insurmountable lead. Yeah. 
FSU fans held their breath in the second half as the Knolls never were able to shake the Tigers. A 39-yard field goal by Mason gave FSU a 22-3 lead, and it was up to the defense to stop Auburn. The Tigers scored their first touchdown early in the fourth quarter, and a successful two-point conversion had fans watching the odd numbers on the scoreboard. With a minute 22 left in the game and everyone in the stadium remembering last year's last second march in the Sugar Bowl, Auburn took over possession for the last time. With their backs to the goal line and the game hanging in the balance, the Seminole secondary smothered Auburn's receivers and Shelton Thompson tripped up a scrambling Reggie Slack to assure the tribe of a 22-14 win. Our defense rose to the occasion in that ball game, just like they did the year before in the Sugar Bowl. Our defense was the was the difference uh, in us winning that ball game. FSU had won five in a row and faced arch enemy Miami just seven days later in Tallahassee. For the fifth time in eight games, the Seminoles would play in front of a national television audience. And just about every sports fan in America tuned in to see the rematch of what has become the game of the year in college football. Miami was the only team to beat Florida State over the previous two years, and the Hurricanes were once again undefeated and ranked second in the country. A record crowd filled Doak Campbell Stadium to watch one of college football's most exciting games. And it was every bit of that. FSU wasted little time in showing Miami that it would be a tough day. Ready for the first snap of the game. He will play fake and drop back to throw. Under pressure, he gets out of the pocket, runs toward the right side, gets the pass over. It is picked off oh, by Leroy right. Butler. Butler's got it at the 36-yard line, and the Seminoles force the first turnover. On first down, Bennett and Carter are the starting running backs. Handoff goes to Dexter Carter, tries to get outside, gets the corner turn. He is to the 30-yard line. He is to the 20-yard line. Down the sideline, Dexter Carter. Touchdown, Florida State. First play from scrimmage. A 37-yard touchdown run. Listen to that crowd. My, my, was a block thrown by Edgar Bennett. And what a piece of nifty running by Dexter Carter, the senior. Miami matched the Tribe seven points when they took the ensuing kickoff and drove 80 yards, scoring with 9.57 left in the first quarter. The Seminoles made it look like an offensive shooting match as Peter Tom Willis hit four different receivers on an 81-yard drive that culminated in Edgar Bennett's one-yard touchdown plunge. From the one, three tight ends set, handoff to Bennett. Bennett dives, touchdown, Florida State off right tackle. The Seminoles have taken a 13-7 lead. Miami could answer only with a 44-yard or to field goal late in the first quarter. From that point, it was all Seminole defense as the Tribe held the potent Hurricane scoreless for the last three quarters. Miami threatened, but each time FSU came up with the big play to kill a UM drive. Miami's first threat came with a ball just inches away from the goal line. From the one, Toretta rolling toward his right, gets the pass away. It is picked off! Intercepted in the end zone. Miami again had the nose of the football just outside the Tribe's goal line with just under eight minutes left in the third quarter. 6-7 at the line of scrimmage, handoff to McGraw. Loose football! Loose football diving on it. Who's come up with it? Florida it looks State. like Florida State has recovered at the one-yard line. On another third and goal, Miami tailback Crowley tried to leap over the heart of the Seminole defense and was met by four Seminole helmets. He lost the football, and Kirk Carruthers' recovery kept the momentum.
It was appropriate that Carruthers killed the drive, as the sophomore linebacker was a one-man wrecking crew against the Hurricane offense. Whether he was blitzing, covering the run, or taking care of business inside, Carruthers was devastating. He tallied 16 tackles, 11 by himself, and intercepted a pair of Miami passes. For his efforts, the sophomore was named Sports Illustrated Defensive Player of the Week. We definitely knew that you know, much of the ball game relied upon the defense and uh, everyone was pretty much ready and uh, I was thankful to have that kind of a game and uh, you know, to try to help with the win and uh, we were just really grateful that we played that well. After Carruthers' recovery, the Seminoles showed their championship stuff when, on their own one-yard line, Willis dropped back and hit a streaking Ronald Lewis for a gutsy 51-yard completion. Seven straight rushing plays into the heart of the nation's top defense took the Seminoles to the Miami two. And Amp Lee broke the plane of the goal with 2-12 left in the third quarter to send the score to 21-10. And FSU fans into euphoria. With a big lead and the momentum, the FSU defensive front came after Gino Toretta like he was the last piece of ham in the fridge. They hassled him into three quick tosses on UM's ensuing possession, and Miami's 37-yard punt put the Tribe near midfield for its next possession. FSU used the run again, reeling off four plays before the drive stalled at the UM23. And Richie Andrews came in to nail a 41-yard field goal just as the fourth quarter began. Miami managed just three first downs in the fourth quarter, one on a penalty, as the Seminoles dominated the eventual national champions 24-10. Well, there wasn't a bigger ball game on our schedule the last 10 years than the University of Miami ball game. It's a shame that we already had two preseason losses with that one because we played a great game over a team that we thought was, was as good as anybody in the nation. And uh, the team that two weeks later just beat Notre Dame decisively. And yet we beat Miami as decisively as they beat Notre Dame. So it was our finest hour, I thought, during the uh, 89 season. Homecoming 1989 was a sweet one, as Seminole faithful sold out Doe Campbell Stadium for the fifth time in as many games. For the second year in a row, Peter Tom Willis torpedoed South Carolina's hopes of an upset by routing the Gamecocks early. The Seminoles put to rest any worry of a letdown after big emotional wins over Auburn and Miami the two previous weeks. It was FSU all over South Carolina, scoring the first 21 points. In the second half, FSU was on the warpath again by using a good mix of the pass and run. Moore punches it through and finishes the 35 to 10 shellacking of South Carolina. Peter Tom Willis, who had a near perfect outing in last year's 59 to nothing romp of USC, hit 25 of 38 passes for 362 yards and three touchdowns. Ronald Lewis is the receiving hero, snagging six passes for 116 yards. Leroy Butler registered an interception for the third time in the last four games, and Anthony Moss had a pair of sacks to lead the defense. The Seminoles get their seventh in a row and move back to the number five spot in the polls. If there has ever been a better first half of offensive football, scholars are hard pressed to name it. In fact, the second quarter may have been the greatest ever, certainly for FSU, as Peter Tom Willis threw for six touchdowns in the first half to lead the Seminoles to a 57 to 20 trouncing of Memphis State. 
Willis completed 23 of 31 passes for 482 yards and the six TDs in just over a half of playing time in the game. Willis completed 23 of 31 passes for 482 yards and the six TDs in just over a half of playing time in the game. Well, it was fun. It just seemed like everything was open and, um, you know, the receivers were catching the ball and getting it in the end zone and that's always a lot of fun to sit there and just throw it out there to them and watch them, you know, run around. It's a lot of fun for me and, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just happy I was part of that day. When the dust had settled, FSU had recorded their eighth consecutive win, pushed its record to eight and two, and secured their third consecutive New Year's Day Bowl. Only intrastate rival Florida stood between this FSU team and destiny. December 2nd, Florida Field in Gainesville was the site for this annual showdown for state bragging rights and a state championship for the tribe. Played at night for yet another national ESPN telecast, the Gators were looking to ease some of the season-long turmoil that had followed them, while the Seminoles looked for three in a row against their arch rivals. With over 75,000 packing the stands, this game would be closer than expected. Peter Tom Willis and Dexter Carter would lead the way for the Garnet and Golden offense. This last game of the season, we've had a miraculous turnaround after over two start. You know, I feel very good about the way um, we finished the season up and we wanted to go into Florida with the confidence that we were going to win the game. We knew it was going to be a tough game, but you know, um, we knew that regardless of what what kind of team they have, what we have, it's going to be a battle throughout the game every year. So going to the game, we knew we wanted to win. We had to, we had to execute and play well, and they played us tough throughout the game. We just had to pull ourselves together and execute the way we knew we could. Defense set the tone early in the game. Late in the first quarter on Florida State's third possession, the man with all the records finds a streaking Terry Anthony. Willis will play fake and drop back to throw. Steps up into the pocket. Now he wants to go downfield. He's got a receiver wide open. Pass is on the money. Touchdown, Terry Anthony. Seminoles burn the defensive coverage. And Willis just reared back, and his eyes were as big as saucers as he saw Anthony all by himself for a 62-yard bomb. The 62-yard bomb puts FSU on the board first with a 7-0 lead. With two scores, the Gators go up 10-7 before the Knolls offense gets it together. The drive stalls at the UF eight-yard line, and Richie Andrews ties it before the half at 10. Florida State's fierce defense buckles down in the second half, giving up just 88 yards on the ground and a paltry 75 through the air. The inspired Seminole defense punishes ball carriers, giving up just one touchdown over the last two quarters. <laughs> The Seminole offense shook loose early in the second half with a 93-yard drive. Will drop back on third. First down. Fires it to Lassane at the 10. 5, 2, 1. Touchdown, Florida State. Bruce Lassane dragging tacklers from the five. And the big kid from Wildwood refused to go down. The 
The drive has culminated with a 22-yard TD catch by Bruce Lesane that breaks the home team's heart. Willis would hit five different receivers on the drive that puts the tribe in command. After a botched field goal by UF, the Seminoles mounted their final drive, beginning at their own 20. Lightning quick Dexter Carter rips off 30 of his 97 rushing yards on the first two plays. It was Carter again on the drive on a crucial third and five at the Florida 20. Three plays later, Willis finds tight end Dave Roberts to give the Seminoles a 24 to 10 lead and a celebration that could be heard back in Tallahassee. I'll admit, I thought we were better than that. I thought we could beat them more than that. But anytime I'm playing Florida, if you'll let me have one point, that's, that's, that's already settled. I don't want to play anymore. I'll take, I'll take one just to win the game. Winning it is that important. Uh, Florida, what happens is, I don't care who the favorite is, the underdog is such a tradition to him, he's going to pull himself right up to your level and play with you. Florida scored once more late in the game to draw within seven, but it was all garnet and gold as the Tribe hammered the Gators 24 to 17 for their third win in a row over UF. Next for the Tribe was a trip to Tempe, Arizona. Everything about the Sunkiss Fiesta Bowl was familiar for Florida State and Nebraska. Both teams entered the New Year's Day Bowl with slim national championship hopes, but both were being touted as possibly the best of the nation. Unlike the Cornhuskers, the familiarity continued during the game as the Seminoles would put on one of the most impressive shows in all of college football. The Seminole defense was nothing short of awesome on this bright January first day, and it gave FSU's offense time to get itself together and then pour on the coals as Nebraska fans sat back bewildered. Nebraska's only real charge came when they took the opening drive down the field and, by benefit of a fake punt, snuck the ball past the FSU defense for an early 7-0 lead. Early in the second quarter, the sleeping giant awoke, and the FSU offense answered when Odell Higgins pounced on a Nebraska fumble at the 37. Peter Tom Willis hit Lawrence Dossey on a 17-yard pass. Then he found Terry Anthony on a 14-yard touchdown pass to knock the score at 7. Nebraska bounced back with a field goal on their next drive, but it was all FSU from there on, as the Seminoles scored twice more in the second quarter. This set up his five-yard scoring toss to Reggie Johnson that gave FSU the lead for good at 14-10. FSU broke Nebraska's back with a nine-play, 51-yard drive as the first half ended. Willis completed six passes on the TD march, the last collected by Dexter Carter in the end zone for a 21-10 Seminole lead. As the FSU offense was piling three touchdowns on them in the third quarter, the defense was putting a stifling squeeze on quarterback Jerry Godowski and the Nebraska offense. Paul Moore got FSU's hit parade going when he dove up the middle from the one with 5.59 left in the third. And it was a big play by FSU special teamer John Davis that set up the next score.
On the next play, Willis found Reggie Johnson in the end zone for their second touchdown of the day and a 35 to 10 lead. The Knowles would put one more in the Nebraska end zone before the quarter was over. Leroy Butler and Kevin Grant would intercept passes, and three different Seminoles recovered fumbles to lead a devastating defensive performance for the Tribe. They allowed one last touchdown in the fourth quarter to make the final 41-17. to But the FSU defense had humbled a proud Nebraska team that Tom Osborne had called the best consistently that he had had. FSU held Nebraska's top-ranked running offense to just 115 yards all day. Carruthers was all over the field, making a game-high 12 tackles, including a five-yard sack. Dedrick Dodge punished receivers from his safety spot, but it was Peter Tom Willis who stood alone in the spotlight at the end. It was a long journey for this likable senior, but his 422 yards passing and five touchdowns would be Fiesta Bowl records and earn him most valuable player honors. For the third consecutive year, the Seminoles had posted a New Year's Day win, and this 10 and 2 season was surely as sweet as any other. Indeed, Florida State's 1989 season would be like few others in college football. The Seminoles finished the year with their third straight New Year's Day Bowl victory. FSU had accomplished what seemed impossible after the two losses to open the season. They had reeled off 10 straight wins and finished ranked among the nation's top three for the third consecutive year. Peter Tom Willis set or tied 15 new school records as he guided the Seminole offense against six of the nation's 10 top defensive teams. FSU's schedule was ranked toughest in the nation in the preseason, and it would prove to be just that. The Seminoles pulled themselves from the ashes of despair and climbed over the likes of LSU, Syracuse, Auburn, Miami, South Carolina, Florida, and Nebraska to finish knocking on the door of a third national championship. The Seminoles had put down five other bowl champions and soundly whipped the eventual national champion to take its rightful place among Florida State University's best teams ever. The year would end with Coach Bobby Bowden just one man short of being college football's all-time winningest active coach. It would see the FSU staff praised as probably the best in the nation. 1989 was a year to remember, a year to cheer Go Knowles, a year when the nation watched a record seven FSU games on national television. From the spoils come the victors, and from adversity comes champions. Character and leadership would be their motto, as the 1989 Seminoles found the will to win.